morning, Centennial. Won't you please stand and sing with us?
in case you didn't see the um, announcement, the uh, Centennial for Racial Justice team will be having a, a movie preview at 3.30 today. And this song is dedicated to that event. Come check it out. this world, that we could bring peace, 
of hope that is found only in you. God, thank you for this place. Thank you for this body of believers. And thank you for the grace and mercy that is made new every single day in your son's name. It is in that name that we pray. Amen. Won't you please be seated? Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm so glad to see all of you here. If you don't know me, my name is Pastor Whitney Sheridan, and I'm the campus pastor here at our St. Anthony Park campus of Centennial United Methodist Church. And welcome to each and every one of you who is here in person. Welcome to everyone who's worshiping with us online. Everyone here, like, turn to the AV booth because that cameras are there. And hello, hello. We're so glad that you're here. If you are brand new here, if this is your first time here, welcome. Know that if you are looking for a church family, we would love to be your church family. Amen. Amen. If you're looking for a pastor, I'd love to be your pastor. So welcome to each and every one of you. Our mission here is to create authentic thinking and active disciples of Jesus and to do this thing called life together. Um, whether you are new or you're here every single Sunday, please take a moment to fill out our Connect card. All you have to do is pull out your smartphone if you have one, open your camera, shine it at this pretty QR code, and it'll take you to a place where you can just kind of let us know that you're here, let us know what information you need, and most importantly, let us know how we can be praying for you and supporting you as your family of faith. So as you're filling that out, a couple announcements. Amanda is here in the back to take our kiddos down to Faith Walk. That is our version of Sunday school. And please know as the kiddos run, they have a great time down there. But if your kiddo would rather be here, if you would rather have your kiddo here, um, we love kids in this sanctuary. We love every sound that they make. We love their presence here. And they bring us and gift us so, so much. And they are a vital part of this family of faith. So know that they are welcome to stay throughout our entire worship service. But if your kids do go down to Faith Walk, like, pick them up afterward. That would be helpful to each and every one of us. As Eric mentioned, we are also hosting, the, our racial justice team is hosting an event right here in this sanctuary today at 3.30 for a screening of the movie Sister Stranger. Um, so please, 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 friends, we're going to be viewing that, and then there's going to be a discussion afterward. Um, so please show up. It's a free event, um, and we would love to have you participate in that. Mostly participate in the conversation and the transformation and the change we're all trying to kind of step into and be a part of. A, whole th a big thing in the United Methodist Church is kind of experiencing and participating in God's grace around us so that we can be changed, so that we can be in touch with what God is trying to do within us and around us. Um, and so participating in something like this is a way to do just that. So all are welcome to that. 
We are also going to be celebrating Holy Week with a bang. Um, one of those events being our Easter Fest, which is the Saturday before Easter. Um, we're going to have a big kiddo event over at our Roseville campus, um, but there will be a really cool Easter, like Easter egg scavenger hunt. Um, but we do need help stuffing all those eggs. So I think there are still eggs in the back of the sanctuary. Take some home, stuff them with candy, pray over each of them, and for every kid that's going to receive one of those so that they might know love and like the hope um, that we can all experience in this faith family. All right, friends, I think that's all I have for announcements. So again, welcome to each and every one of you. Um, and a reminder that we are right in the middle of our season of Lent. Um, Lent is when we prepare ourselves, prepare our hearts and minds and souls for Holy Week, for the coming Resurrection Sunday. Um, it's where we get a time to kind of step back, a season of six weeks, where we get to take on different practices, where we get to try new things, as we kind of take a deeper look at how is our relationship with God right now, and consider once again the forgiveness and hope and freedom and life that is made possible for each and every one of us in Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection. So as we continue this journey together, before we get into today's message, let's pause and take a moment to pray. Holy and loving and gracious God, who is here, who is within us and walks alongside us. God, I would pray that what needs to be said be said this day, and what needs to be heard, may it truly be heard. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. All right, friends, so like I said, we are in the season of Lent, and since through Lent, we've been walking through or continuing our walk through the Gospel of John, and specifically kind of the week he spent in Jerusalem leading up to his trial, his death, his crucifixion, and ultimately his resurrection. So we know from weeks past that Jesus, um, where we're catching up in the scripture, Jesus is in Jerusalem, right? And, and folks are looking for him. The Jewish authorities are looking for him. Um, they have sought to arrest him because he's been making a big fuss. He's been gathering all of these followers. He's been saying ridiculous things like, God loves you and forgives you, and you can be healed on the Sabbath because God loves you and forgives you. And, you know, we want you to know, God, God wants you to know so desperately God's love for you, and that's why I am here, says Jesus. Um, and this has made a lot of people angry because it's supposed to be about rules and regulations, and the closer we can, we can see or step into those rules and respect those rules, that's how you get close to God, right? Right. Um, and so there were all of these kind of Jewish authorities that were really, really upset that Jesus was kind of breaking all of these rules and saying it was okay in the name of God, right? So now they're saying he needs to be arrested, not just arrested, he needs to be put to death. So for a while, Jesus was kind of like staying out of Jerusalem, or his disciples were certainly encouraging him to stay out of Jerusalem. Your life is in danger, man, um, and there's not a ton we can do when there's like a bunch of Roman centurions around, right? Right? Um, but lo and behold, they're going to go back to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We're going to celebrate, you know, that arrival where Jesus says, I'm not hiding. I'm here to do a thing and everyone needs to see it, right? So he has that, joy, uh, that triumphant arrival into Jerusalem and people are waving palm fronds, Hosanna in the highest. Um, so he's there, right? And then we see these little scenes where he turns from his public ministry to his private ministry. Two weeks ago, we talked about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. He's preparing for his death by turning to his best friends, his disciples, and saying goodbye for now to them, preparing them for what was to come for them. So now we have Jesus. Um, today, we, um, he has been arrested. Um, he has been taken by the, by the Jewish authorities. Um, Judas told him where he was going to be and kind of led these, um, these soldiers to him. Jesus has been arrested. Um, but now the Sanhedrin, the like high court of the Jewish authorities, the temple authorities, um, can't do anything with him. They can't do what they want to do with him, which is ultimately kill him. Because it's Passover, it's a holiday. They're not allowed to do something like that. And so they're bringing him now to the Roman authorities. Suddenly we see the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities trying to work together in order to get rid of Jesus. So that's where we're jumping into our scripture today. So let's read from John chapter 18. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. 
They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, would we not have handed him over to you? Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. When Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests has handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. All right, so friends, a few things just to pull out from this scripture, right? Um, the, Jew, the Jewish authorities, the only thing they can think of to like go to the Romans and say, hey, you should be paying attention and worried about this guy too. You should be threatened about this guy too was saying like, he's calling himself the king of the Jews, right? That's another authority figure that could come and threaten like your authority around here, right? That should make you pretty mad, right? And that's kind of why Pilate is asking all of these questions about being a king, um, and why he's still like, well, you say you're not like a king from here, so what do I care? You can hear his confusion right throughout this interrogation, throughout this trial. So here's the thing. This is like one of, this is a part of Jesus' trial, according to the Gospel of John. And trials are supposed to be all about what? Truth. Finding out the truth and finding an appropriate consequence for whatever the truth ends up being. Now we know that there are often mistakes that happen in trials, amen? Prejudice comes into play often when we have trials and things like this. And yet Jesus' trial is absolutely no different, right? The Jewish authorities, they want something very specific to happen. They have a very specific outcome in mind, and they are trying to find any way to make that happen. And when they find that it's over Passover, right, and suddenly they themselves can't take care of it, can't do it themselves. Um, and even before then, people were challenging, like, okay, you keep saying you want to kill this guy, but remember, it's part of Jewish law to have a fair trial. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And like trying to shove those people away. Like, don't listen to them. Um, because they're amped, they're angry, they're threatened by Jesus. So suddenly we start to see the Jewish authorities throw their own rules to the side because they are so threatened, they are feeling so defensive, and their defensiveness is leading to real violence and danger. So they can't do it themselves, and so they're trying to find these loopholes, right? Well, the Romans can kill anybody at any time, right? They can throw people up on a cross, um, and so let's do that. So the Jews are literally asking the Romans and Pilate to do their dirty work for them, which is super ironic later when they say, like, the, the, the Jewish authorities didn't enter the headquarters of Pilate, so they didn't become defiled and wouldn't be able to participate in Passover, right? They had to remain clean. So they couldn't even enter the headquarters because they would be defiled. They, could, they needed someone else to like get dirty for them because they were unwilling to do so. Ironic, amen? Yes? And also, it seems very, like they don't really care about Jesus, who they shove through the door, right? He's already dirty. We don't care about him. He can be all so defiled. They're trying to find all of these ways to get everyone to turn against Jesus. 
And so Pilate and Jesus have this bizarre exchange, right? Well, are you, like, why do they send you? Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, did you come up with that or did they come up with that? And they okay, well, your own people, like, want you um, out of here, so you must not be a very good king. Am I supposed to be threatened by a king that's own people, like, want him to die? And he's like, look, if this were my kingdom, my followers would be all over violently trying to free me. But remember, I am ushering in a new kind of kingdom, a new way of life. My kingdom is not from here. My kingdom is a, 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 another place, is a different place. And then, uh, start, uh, uh, and Jesus says, but what I am here to do is like to, to talk about truth, to usher in and testify to God's truth. And Pilate asks, ultimately at the end before, he, you can almost hear him like he kind of, well, what even is truth? Like he, his hand, he's fed up with this experience. He's fed up with the position he has been set in. So he kind of throws his hands up and says, what even is truth? As he mutters to himself, we think, you know, we could imagine as he walks out the door. Because Jesus doesn't answer him in this exchange, right? In this version of the story. What is truth? And for those of you who have been here and worshiping with us throughout the entire time as we've been walking through the Gospel of John, has anyone noticed that truth is a very particular theme in the Gospel of John? There is a Greek word, aletheia. Everyone say aletheia. Aletheia, that is a Greek word for truth. It is used 25 times in the Gospel of John. And the other Gospels only used a handful of times or less like five times or less. So the truth, what, we're, what Jesus is doing, like the, in the Gospel of John, God's truth, this becomes like a defining part or the, like the definition of Jesus' ministry, right? Jesus is here to testify, to reveal God's truth to us, particularly as it comes in juxtaposition as suddenly it looks very different from the truth that the rest of the world would present to us, Right? Think about all the times Jesus started to make people mad, right? Um, when he started to heal on the Sabbath, when he started to cross borders, right? To go to the people that we weren't supposed to talk to, we weren't supposed to acknowledge, we weren't supposed to offer grace and hospitality and, 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 and honestly hope and life and like our hearts too. Because they weren't following the truth. And yet here Jesus does, he shows up and says, God's truth is for everyone. God's truth about forgiveness and love and grace for everyone. That is what I am here to do. The Gospel of John, again, is defined by, by truth. Starts from the very beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, God, was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh to dwell among us. And this Word that came to dwell among us was filled with grace and truth says John the Baptist was here to testify and point us to the truth, who is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus will later in the upper room or um, in the upper room at the, at the Last Supper will say, um, or in that kind of goodbye scene to his disciples, says, and I'm going to be sending to you an advocate, the spirit of truth. God is is defined by truth. Jesus and Jesus' ministry is defined by truth. The Holy Spirit is defined by truth. The three persons of the Trinity are working together here to reveal to us the truth. And so when Pilate says, like, what is truth? It could be that the whole community of the Gospel of John is saying, where do we even begin? We've been talking about it for chapters and chapters. And yet... As I was reading through this scripture, learning all these cool fun facts about the word truth in the Gospel of John, right? Going and finding those pieces and following them almost like breadcrumbs. I still got to that question, what is truth? And I did ask, where do we even begin? Because I don't know about you, but there is a lot about God's truth that still seems like a great big mystery to me. Amen? Especially when we start to equate truth with answers. Anyone else also kind of sometimes at a loss or a little befuddled by the mystery of God and God's truth? I have a lot of questions that I am still wondering about, that I am still searching for God's truth in. 
a lot of questions about, well, it seems like, you know, the, these, we as followers of Christ, we've been trying to, like, figure this God's truth out for 2,000 years, and sometimes it feels like we are no closer as a capital C church. Amen? We've still been fighting with each other about what God's truth is for 2,000 years. I have big questions about God's truth when it comes to suffering, when it comes to why people suffer, why some people seem to suffer more than others. And these are questions that even the holiest of people in the world, friends, still can't answer. There is still a lot of mystery around God's truth. And so what do we do with that? It's supposed to be, it feels like as we read through the Gospel of John, this God's truth thing, this thing that Jesus has been trying to reveal to us and explain to us for his entire ministry should be very obvious to us by now, amen? And yet it still seems hidden to us in so many places. And so I started to look at what else came from that community, that Johannine community, right, out of which the Gospel of John comes um, comes from. And there are three letters later in our New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, right? Really short letters that also come out of this community. And there, that theme of truth is certainly there, but they start to use this phrase, to walk in truth. That we, we hope and we pray that the followers of Jesus continue to walk in truth. And there was something there that was helpful to me as I was asking myself, as Pilate is asking, what even is truth? This idea of walking in truth, right? Suddenly, it's not a thing that I need to like, that I can't quite translate yet in my head. It's not a word, it's not one of those like, um, what are those, those magic eye things where suddenly like it pops out at you if you stare at it long enough. But suddenly it becomes walking in truth seems like an action, right? Seems like a journey, seems like a relationship that we get to participate in. And it is on that journey, it is within that relationship that the truth finally gets to be revealed or slowly is revealed. Moments of it are revealed to us. Jesus said to Pilate, anyone who belongs to the truth will listen to my voice, will listen to what I say, will listen to what I tell them to do. And earlier, as he's saying goodbye to those disciples, after he has washed his feet, he says, listen to my commandments. If you are followers of me, you will listen and keep my commandments. And those commandments are, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Just as I have loved you, the word of God made flesh to dwell among you. Just as God loves you, so you must love each other. God's truth that continues to be revealed to us in Jesus Christ, witnessed to and testified to, God's truth gets to be revealed to us in our journey, in our lifetime, seeking to love one another. We might not suddenly wake up one morning and get it and suddenly know what God's truth is down to the letter. But I think there is something to be said for this journey of faith and doing this life with God in Jesus Christ. Seeking to do what God tells us to do, to love one another, and how in that journey, in that complex journey, friends, because that is hard work, amen? We just had a whole sermon series before Lent about how hard that is, amen? Especially right now, especially when we have been handed on a silver platter all the reasons we need to not like each other, to not love each other, to separate from one another, to be divided, right? Being called to come and love one another, that is a journey in itself. And God is trying to teach us to reveal God's very truth to us in that. And so I would ask you, even in this, if you kind of thought of those, this last two years, right, friends, raise your hand if you learned a lesson over this time of COVID. 
It could be a teensy one. It could be a big one. But we all learned a lesson, right? At least one. It was hard to do. Suddenly, we had to redefine what community was and how we functioned. Suddenly, we had to redefine what family was and how it functioned. Suddenly, we had to redefine who we were and how we functioned. We had to figure out how to love one another when we couldn't, like, stand right next to each other sometimes and all the time. I would ask you, what truth revealed itself to you as you sought to survive and love through this pandemic, through the last two years? And now as we continue to face the rest of our lives, right, hopefully and slowly coming out of this pandemic season, and yet we're still faced with, like, the rest of the world, right? Community is still hard. Loving one another is still hard. What truths are still yet to be revealed to you? What big questions do you still have for God? And how can we recommit ourselves to this commandment to love one another and trust that those big questions we have, those un, seemingly unanswerable questions that we have that reside so deeply in our souls that sometimes feel like big gaping holes within us, right? How can we trust that God is revealing God's truth to us and will continue to reveal God's truth to us in our life of faith? in our commitment to follow Jesus, to listen to Jesus when he says, love one another. As God has loved you without prejudice, as God has loved you so freely and so full of grace, so generously, that's how you are to love one another. It's quite a journey, friends, but it is not one without hope. God is still revealing to us God's self in Jesus Christ. So will we keep looking? Will we keep asking? Will we keep loving one another and expect to be changed? Let's pray. God of hope and God of grace, we are grateful that in all the big questions that sit within us, that sit heavy on our hearts, oh God, you are loving us in the midst of it. And you are calling us to perpetually grow in love for ourselves and for one another and for you. And in that, you are revealing yourself to us over and over and over again. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And may we be the followers of Jesus who hear our good shepherd's voice, who walk in truth, who participate in the grace you offer us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, family of faith, we've reached our time of offering. And as many of you know, we are in the middle of a campaign where we're trying to raise funds for what's called our apportionments. Everyone say apportionments. It is a part of being part of a larger church. The United Methodist Church is a global church. And together, because we are part of something bigger than ourselves, we can do big things in the world. So every local church is asked to give their portion. It's kind of like our tithe to the larger church. And so we've been lifting up kind of each week, what do we do with those apportionments? Where do those dollars go? And so this letter is from our finance team. They say, good morning to you. During the Lenten season, we have been learning about all the ways our $115 um, per member apportionments support Centennial's mission to be followers of Jesus who go out and build loving and just communities. If you have not yet contributed, please consider, consider doing so. And even if you cannot contribute a whole 115, any amount helps. And if you are blessed to be able to contribute more, we welcome your generosity. Today is actually designated the UMCOR UMCOR or United Methodist Committee on Relief Sunday across the United Methodist Church. So it is fitting that our apportionment focus today 
is on that United Methodist Committee on Relief, an organization that acts on our collective behalf as Methodists when there is a crisis. But UMCOR doesn't just respond to emergencies for short term. Working with local organizations, churches in the community, and United Methodist volunteers, UMCOR cultivates relationships and help build communi or helps communities rebuild, often for years after a disaster. UMCOR has been committed to alleviating suffering and giving hope continuously since 1940. Regardless of the disaster, your gifts and UMCOR's network of partners around the world ensure outreach to those in need when they need it most. So please be an ambassador for Christ to relieve suffering by generously giving to Centennial's apportionment campaign, which in turn delivers funds to UMCOR. And now we'll have a short video to show you a little bit more, to brag a little bit more about UMCOR. Mandatory evacuation for zone It's eight. tropical cyclone Deneo, and it's expected to become. This is by far worse than any mouse thing. There's an old definition of a disaster, and that's to be without a star. And the thing that happens many times after disasters is that the power goes out in some places, and people can actually see the stars. But they can also see the stars in one another. Peace that would pass his understanding, and with leadership that would guide people through their time of need. AMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, is the disaster and the development uh, arm of the whole United Methodist Church. When you give to AMCOR, you give 100% to the project you are supporting and to the disaster you want to respond to. This is only possible because on AMCOR Sunday, the United Methodist people raise funds so that the administrative costs of AMCOR are already covered. Well, UMCOR, of course, responds to emergencies with funding, training, and expertise, but we're mostly known for being in it for the long haul. Uh, we work alongside the conferences as they set up projects and programs to try to see families and individuals through to their recovery, which sometimes takes months and most often years. We're very busy. We're a very small team but we work hard then. UMCOR exists because of the donation of its members, it, the UMC people. So if there is a million people giving a $1 each, it makes more than one person giving 10,000. UMCOR has been for more than 75 years in this business of being hope, of being there for people in need in the moment of disaster when they have lost everything. And through AMCOR, the United Methodist people are hope in these situations. You know, walls are coming down, um, people are, are coming together. And they don't have power yet, but they're still finding ways to feed each other. And that feeds the soul, not just the body. Lift up those who have fallen. What a privilege it is those. to be part of this important ministry, the United Methodist Church, to be able to say we're there, we bring hope, and we bring healing. As people are helping their neighbor and helping each other in their community, they begin to see that the love of God has not left them. It's right there. So UMCOR wants to support that wonderful thing that can happen after disasters. UMCOR wants to be there with the people who are noticing the stars in one another, and they're noticing God's grace all around them. So we do invite you to give and give joyfully to the ministries of Centennial United Methodist Church, to the ministries of the global United Methodist Church. So here we have a QR code um, and also a text to give option. So let us give. Amen. to do, uh, listen to this song this morning. Uh, a woman got a, a hold of me this week and uh, she somehow found this song on YouTube that I wrote 11 years ago and she said, I haven't been able to feel my leg in three weeks and 
this song has given me hope this week. I feel like a lot of us are in that place with the situation in Ukraine, just the th- situations around us, or could you all use a little glimmer of hope? So just offer this to you all this morning. If I could only see your plan Oh, you could help me understand When tragedy comes Maybe I wouldn't feel Ha! 
trust in you. Well, I will trust in you. Well, I will trust in you. Well, I will trust in you. Trust in you. Well, I will trust in you. Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. of faith. It is a blessing to be here together to do this, worship this life, to ask these big questions together, to gather around this table together. It is an eternal reminder that we are not alone, that God's love is here for us, that God's grace and forgiveness is here for us and offered freely to us every so as we prepare to come to this table, as we prepare our hearts and souls to receive the gifts of bread and cup, let us join our voices together in the prayer of confession. Most merciful God, whose son Jesus Christ was tempted in every way, yet without sin, we confess before you that we have sinned. We have hungered after that which does not satisfy. We have compromised with evil. We have doubted your power to protect us. Forgive our lack of faith. Have mercy on our weakness. Restore in us such love and trust that we may walk in your ways and delight in doing your will. May we forever walk in the truth of God. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving and gracious God, we gather together. We gather together, everyone gathered here in person, virtually everyone who has ever gathered around this table. We walk alongside them and we remember with them Jesus and how on the night he was to be betrayed, he gathered with his family, his best friends, And when we are left to face that which we fear most, we remember that in the middle of supper, Jesus took a loaf of bread, he broke it, he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, my whole self given for you. Every time you remember, or every time you eat of this bread, remember that and remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it and gave it to his disciples and invited them to drink. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant, the cup of life, of hope, of forgiveness poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of this cup, remember that. Remember me. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of truth. 
that is within us, that is beside us, that is perpetually revealing and witnessing to God's love right in front of us. May you fall afresh on all of us gathered here and on these simple gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be the body of Christ that is redeemed, that is forgiven, that is set free by your love and sacrifice for us. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us our Lord's prayer and so we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Family of faith, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. No matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, or what has been done to you, these gifts are for you. If you weren't able to grab communion elements on your way in, please raise your hand and we will make sure they are brought to you. But as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember, you are deeply loved and you are not alone. Amen and amen.
family of faith, as you go from this time, from this place of worship, as you face all that is to come this week, all the hard things we have to do, all the imperfect relationships, all the imperfect reactions, may you know that we seek to walk in truth, that we will seek that truth through loving one another. May you go from this place knowing the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ,